Welcome back to Books of the Book. I'm Pastor Mark Howard, and I am here with my co-host, my brother Jim. And uh, we have just been having a great time going through the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. And today we are, we are in the 11th chapter of the book of Acts, where we were studying a little bit last time. And we'll uh, re recap a little bit of that after a word of prayer. Let's ask God to bless our time in study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask now that the Holy Spirit would guide our minds and our understanding, as well as our hearts, Father. Help us to be willing to receive what it is you have for us today in your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Jim, last time you recall we were talking about the uh, conversion of the household of Cornelius, which in and, in and of itself is, is a miraculous thing. Yes, it wasn't Lord. just Cornelius, but his household, and it tells us the kind of person he was mm that uh, just like Abraham led his household after himself, here Cornelius is a man who has that impact over his influence, home, yes. that influence, and uses his influence for the Lord. And so should we in every one of our homes. Our homes should be reflective of the will of God. Now, it, toward the end of that story, uh, we find that Peter, after Cornelius and, the and his household are baptized, and you would expect that the people would be excited. And when Peter tells the other uh, uh, brethren they are upset with him that he has gone to the Gentiles mm -hmm. until Peter recounts the whole story of how God led that experience. And he says, and we read this last time, we're going to read it again in, in uh, chapter 11, verse uh, 15. Peter says, As I begin to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. And then he says in verse uh, 18, uh, verse 17 rather, if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Mm -hmm. Now this was a powerful evidence to the church there and to Peter himself. Yes. If, if, if we saw the same uh, experience with the Holy Spirit come upon them as came upon us, then who am I to forbid it? Yeah. Now the danger here, Jim, is that sometimes we can look at these things and get some people will come away with the idea that, well, it really doesn't matter what the Bible teaches if I have something in my experience that seems to say different. And what we, we, we use a verse like this sometimes and we'll say, well, Peter, that's what Peter's saying is he had an experience that went contrary to the way he thought. And because of that experience, he said, hey, who am I to disagree? Yeah. But it was more than just an experience. That's right. I, <clears throat> I can think of people that I've studied with who have been part of a body of believers who they come to an understanding, don't really believe everything uh, truthfully as the Bible teaches it, but because of the experiences that happen there, and uh, there could be all sorts of different experiences. It could just be attendance, yes. right? It could be a, a, there's so many people coming and worshiping God, and it, 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 from our appearance, in a subjective sense, it looks like the Spirit is blessing. Yeah, so many people are doing this, how could it be wrong? Right, but I think it's important that we recognize and we tried to do this at the end of last time, but we needed to take a little bit more time this, uh, this episode. You know, when Peter uh, here is saying these things uh, about what happened in his experience, it's more than just the experience that gave them the evidence that the Gentiles would now be recipients of the gospel. It was more than just a subjective, wow, we see what the Spirit has done and now we know. Peter also received a vision from God prophetic inspiration, That's right. um, which is equivalent to you and I uh, seeing something in the Word. So it's not just experience, which can be subjective, but it's also experience that is compatible with or affirms what we know from inspired writings, inspiration uh, from through the prophets. That's right. And it wasn't the gospel going to the Gentiles was not foreign to Scripture. That's right. The Old Testament scriptures taught in many places that the gospel would go to the, to the Gentile nations. Isaiah 56 is one that comes to my mind, but there are others. And so there was more than just that experience. Right. And uh, I think to myself, Jim, of a passage in Revelation chapter 13, where the Bible says uh, something mm. that really ought to, take, uh, ought to grab our attention. And I'm actually going to turn there to Revelation 13 and verse 13. The Bible tells us about... Uh, a collaboration between some powers at the end of time that are working to deceive. And it tells us in Revelation 13, 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Now what's, what's really interesting and, and important about that is 
The fire coming down from heaven was something we find in the Old Testament in the book mm. of 1 Kings chapter 18 right. that God used as an evidence of his power in the ministry of the prophet Elijah. So God used it as a sign of his power. But what the Bible tells us is that the enemy of righteousness is going to use it as a sign of his power at the end of time. Mm. So people are going to see the fire come down and say, well, wow, we saw this elsewhere, and this is the evidence that this is from God. And so those signs or miracles are not, we can't base our, our confidence in that alone. So you have to have the scripture and an inspired testimony to accompany those miracles and those signs. That's right, and we see that here in the early church in a number of places. Now we're in Acts chapter 11 and we're picking up in verse 19, and in fact, verse 19 picks up something we have seen earlier. It tells us in, in verse 19, now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. Now there's a couple things here to note. First of all, We've talked in our last episode, for example, about how the gospel had shifted its emphasis toward the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. But here it says they're, te they're preaching to the Jews only. Now we've got to keep in mind that this group, and it spells them out, they're those who are scattered yes. after the stoning of Stephen. Acts chapter well, eight. that was in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, rather, verses 1 through 4. Those were the ones that were everyone except the apostles. These were the lay people, the church members who were scattered abroad and they were preaching the word. And uh, why are they preaching to the Jews only? Because we've seen where several events have happened that have communicated to the church the gospel to the Gentiles, but that message hasn't spread everywhere yet, yeah. including this group here. Now it goes on to tell us in uh, verse 20, but some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Now we've seen this before too. The church members are the ones who are doing this work. The church is moving and growing powerfully under the work of the church members, so much so that news travels back to headquarters and they send somebody to come and check out what's going on in the church. That's right. <clears throat> and if we look here in verse 22, after it says they sent out Barnabas, it says a little bit about what happens. Uh, verse 23, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encourage them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. You know, we should be excited when we see the success of others Absolutely. rather than being uh, jealous or competitive. And I'm, I'm so thankful for the, the large heartedness of Barnabas to be able to see that, you know, I may not have been the one who, who did all this, but I'm encouraged. I'm excited about this. Not only that, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get in there and work with I'm going to help him. Help. <laughs> That's right. right. It says in verse 24, for he was a good man, mm -hmm. full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then it says, Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Mm. Now, you know, a couple of things stand out to me here. You know, he's encouraging these lay people, but just because the members at large, as we recall back in Acts chapter 8, um, this group that was scattered was all of those who were in the church except the apostles. So all of these, you know, church members who are not in leadership are the ones who are spreading the word. They're here now spreading the word in Antioch. But the leaders still have a role to play. That's right. And they are to cooperate with these lay people, but their role is a little bit different than what we often see today. It's, it appears that their role is uh, almost like that of a foreman who ensures that the work is being accomplished and that help is being given uh, but, and, and work is being provided, but not necessarily doing all the work themselves. So Barnabas and Paul, they didn't do all the work themselves, but they were orchestrating the work. They were helping to manage the work. They were encouraging the work. They were um, resourcing the work, all those types of things. But then there came a time when their teaching abilities and qualities were going to be needful too. And so they're pulled into the mix and uh, spend a whole year teaching the people. So, you know, these lay people brought them to an understanding of Christ and, and conversion and the church was growing. But then to get a little more depth, 
these leaders came in and added some, added some teaching. And it's amazing that in this passage, it says that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes me back up to, uh, to verse 20, where it says that some of them were from Cyprus and Cyrene, etc. cetera. Uh, and it finishes saying that they were preaching the Lord Jesus. That's right. So everywhere that these church members went, they were proclaiming. And as we've said before, preaching is not standing behind a pulpit. Right. But preaching is simply sharing the word, sharing what God has done for you in the word, how he has convicted your heart. And so here we find that these early believers were sharing the word so much and they had Jesus on their lips so much that they said, oh, these Christians, these Christians. It was a slur. It was, it was, it was, it was a negative because of how much they, how fanatical they seemed to be about Jesus. But they liked it. <laughs> I think and they did. And we still do. Call yes, me a Christian. Praise the Lord for it. That's right. Well, we segue in, in verses 27 to 30, just kind of segue into chapter 12, and it brings up a couple interesting points. It says, in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch, and uh, talks about one of the Magabus foretelling a famine. And then verse 29 says, the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. So we see that spirit of sacrifice. It's important to note, as we have earlier, that you know, in, in the end of time, the book of Revelation speaks of a, of a remnant. That is, a, that God's church at the end of time will be a, a portion that will be like what we found here in the beginning. So Acts gives us a model. And we found prophets in the early church right here. And the Bible says that uh, one of the characteristics of God's last day church mm. is the gift of prophecy. That's right. We see the spirit of sacrifice. We ought to see that today in the church too. We ought to see that in our own lives more often. And that leads us then into chapter 12, uh, where we see that Herod is not uh, happy with what is happening here among the church. No, no, not at all. If you look in chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, it says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Uh, and then it goes on in verse 2 to say, Then he killed James the brother of John with the sword. Now, this is some major harassment, but I think it, it's noteworthy here that when it talks about harassing some from the church, you know, when we become Christians, there is no way that we can escape. If we're going to be true to God, That's right. there's no other way that we can escape being harassed in one form or another. Ridicule, um, misunderstanding. There's so many ways in which this harassment happens to us even today. And, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Mm -hmm. When we see all of this persecution in the early church, there's a reason for that. It's because they were faithful. It's because they, they, they spoke the word with boldness. It's because they were actively pressing forward the work. And, uh, you know, if we take hold of that work, if we see lay people and ministers alike, working together on the, under the operation of the Holy Spirit. If we see fidelity and faithfulness to God and standing for biblical principle and biblical practices, we're going to see persecution again. We're going to see harassment again. Well, we need to talk about this, especially this uh, martyrdom of James, the brother of John, but we are now time, uh, at our time for our break. So uh, stay tuned and we'll be back with you in just a few moments. Sometimes when we have to assemble something, we may put a piece in the wrong place and have to start over. Or we may force the wrong piece and break it. We could even get done and find a piece or two left over. At this point, we might think, I should have followed the instructions. We can make mistakes in other walks of life too. So remember to use the instruction book for life that God gave us, the Bible. In Proverbs 3, verse 6, it tells us, in all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. When we follow God's instructions, he's in charge, and the outcome will be pleasing. Welcome back to Books of the Book. Before the break, Mark, we were looking at Acts chapter 12, where it said that Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. That's right. Even going so far as killing James, the brother of John, with a sword. This was the first one of the apostles now who was met with death in, in the new church. That's right. And in verse 3, something very interesting is brought out. It says, because he saw that it pleased the Jews, 
he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Mm -hmm. So clearly the, the reason for this was not uh, because that, of Peter doing something wrong, but political reasons. He saw that there was uh, favor he was gaining with the Jews, and That's wow, right. if they were happy about that, well, what, what will they do when we get the great apostle Peter? Right. So you continue, and it says, now it was during the days of unleavened bread, so <clears throat> there would be many people around, and it said in verse 4, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Mm -hmm. Now, four squads of soldiers sounds like a lot of soldiers. <laughs> and it is I, a lot of soldiers. <laughs> yeah, and it is. And so I believe that the Bible is, first of all, God allowed it, and secondly, the Bible points it out, because it's going to show just how miraculous what about, is about to happen is really going to be. Now, when we get to verse 5, it says Peter you know, was... Why would they put four squads of soldiers on Peter anyway? <laughs> that's, a very, <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, you know, we recognize, first of all, that remember when they put squads of soldiers around Jesus' tomb, that's that right. that didn't work out all that well for them, right? Oh. And we recognize that there's all these supernatural experiences that are going on in the book of Acts, and I believe that they knew that they needed to be especially careful and uh, make sure that Peter was kept bound. Well, his last imprisonment, he was free. it doesn't tell us what happened to the guards there. It's going to tell us what happens to them here. But he had guards. It doesn't tell us how many. But evidently, they felt they needed to beef up security. Because he showed up in the temple preaching yeah, and, that time. And the guards had no idea. Exactly they opened right. the door, and he's gone. That's exactly right. So as we read verse 5, it says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the mm. church. Now, this is a valid and important point that we need to stop and pause at. You know, oftentimes we hear about things going on that are important, and we know they're important, but we fail to pray. We fail to take them before the Lord. And uh, I believe that there are times when we fail to bring something before the Lord, and as a result, the Lord does not respond. Um, if we don't have in our hearts the desire for the will of the Lord and the outcome that, we, that, uh, that would be glorifying to God, then he may not bring it about. That's He's true. looking for us to show a deep and abiding interest. I think about when we do outreach projects for the church, and yet we don't stop and take time to pray. You know, if we're not going to plead with the Lord, if we're not interested enough, then he's not going to be able to open the door of blessing to us, and we're not going to be able to recognize it. So this is a pattern for us. These early believers were in constant prayer, and they were offering it to God for Peter because of his imprisonment. That's right. And, you know, Jim, it reminds me of a statement in, uh, you had met, referenced a book before called The Great Controversy that yes. talks about the history of the church. And uh, the author in that book makes a statement that says, and I believe it's on page 525 of that book, that says that it is part of God's plan to grant us in, or in, uh, in answer to the prayer of faith that which he would not bestow if we did not thus ask. Mm -hmm. That's true. And we see that in different places in Scripture where when the church prays, we find a response. Mm -hmm. And um, it's Jesus who said, uh, ask and it should be given unto you. It's James who tells us later on, ye have not because ye ask not. So we, we go on here, the church is praying, and the Bible tells us in verse 6, when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now, I, I am just uh, blown away by this for a couple reasons. First of all, James was just killed. Mm -hmm. So that tells Peter that there are no idle threats here. This is a real and genuine threat. He is in the prison, very likely to be killed in his own mind. And what's he doing? He's sleeping. That's right. And he's not just sleeping lightly, as we're going to see in a moment. Furthermore, he's, he's got four squads of soldiers, a squad, and, and my marginal reading says tetrads. There's four. There's a 16 soldiers. I don't know if that includes the guards he's chained between. So before there were guards at the door, but now... He's got a guard, and he's chained either on either arm. side, so he can't move without somebody knowing it. He's asleep. <laughs> I have I, a hard time sleeping when I'm away from home in the hotel bed, <laughs> let alone right. chained to a couple of guys. And so here we have, <laughs> exactly, and here we have, he says, uh, verse uh, 7, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, 
And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. Now he struck mm. Peter. So it wasn't mm. like tap, 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 like Peter was lightly sleeping. He couldn't sleep well. Right. He was sound asleep. Right. That's how much trust he had Amen. in the Lord. Hey, if, if death is where I've got to go now, I'm trusting everything Amen. in the hand of my Savior. Now, it's just powerful. Mm. But he's, the angel strikes him on the side and tells him to get dressed. And then the Bible says that, um, verse 9, he went out, Peter went out and followed him and did not know what was done, but uh, did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. <laughs> And uh, it says, when they were past the first and came, I'm sorry, when they, verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. Now, the whole account, I don't know if it happened noiselessly, for Peter, if he heard clanging or whatever, but the bottom line is nobody woke up. That's right. <laughs> the, the squads of soldiers didn't wake up. Then he went by the guard posts to nobody's attention, and the angel escorts him out, and the Bible says in verse 11, Now when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectations of the Jewish people. Amen. Oh, what a powerful deliverance. Powerful. A jailbreak. That's a right. A divine jailbreak, right? <laughs> That's exactly what it was. You know, you look back at verse 11, it says, When Peter had come to himself, I mean, this was so miraculous that he was having a hard time believing it himself. Right. I mean, it says, you know, he thought he was seeing a vision. This can't be happening. And finally, he comes to himself. He's like, no, this is happening. This is real. And uh, his surprise is, is uh, shared by those that he now comes to see. That's right. <laughs> because if you keep reading, it says in, uh, in verse, uh, uh, verse 12, so when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Mm -hmm. There they are, mm -hmm. gathered together praying. Which had a lot to do with his deliverance. That's exactly it? right. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. This is a, <laughs> this is a, a pretty funny story. Rhoda comes to the to the uh, gate and you know she hears Peter and oh, it's Peter and instead of opening to him he's waiting she flies back to talk and tell everybody else about so he it. doesn't know what's going on he's knocking knocking no response <laughs> makes me think of the woman at the well who left her water pot yes and and you know what grabs what grabs me here Jim is the joy that comes through through God's blessings That's God right. blessed them with this deliverance of Peter and uh, I don't think we do enough rejoicing for the blessings of God. The That's woman right. with, the, with at the well, uh, Jacob's well in John 4, left her water pot. She came there to draw water. She forgot all about it. That's she right. went her way rejoicing. And so we see here with Rhoda. It reminds me of that song, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory That's and grace. Right. The things of earth, whatever it is, whatever common things they are, when, when a revelation from God comes, everything else pales in significance. That's right. So we see here in verse 14, it says that she recognized Peter's voice. She ran in to announce that Peter stood before the gate. And then in verse 15, but they said to her, you're beside yourself. Yeah. Okay, so now they don't believe you're it either. You're crazy. Yet she kept insisting. That's that what it, they told the women who went to find the body. <laughs> he came back, he's risen. You guys are crazy. No, he isn't. <laughs> that's right, exactly. We won't say what that has to, what that, what comment on what that says about men and their <laughs> Please, <laughs> faith sometimes. Please don't. Let's move on. It says, but they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, well, it is his angel. So they're thinking, well, it must be his angel. In verse 16, now Peter continued knocking. <laughs> like, when are they going to open up? And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. So they're astonished and they're all excited. And he's like, shh, quiet. Because, of course, there's still, uh, you know, there's persecution going on here. So he doesn't want to broadcast the fact that he right. has been set free. So he gets, he gets brought in and he begins to uh, share with them the account of what happened. Yeah, powerful. And, and then apparently he gives them word to go on and tell the 
apostles who aren't there, the leaders of the church, and he moves on to another place. That's I mean, right. he doesn't go to recoup somewhere. He doesn't say, no. look, I'm going to take a vacation after that. <laughs> My life was threatened. I don't know what to do. <laughs> He's back out preaching the word. That's exactly right. It's powerful. He's moving from place to place, Lydda right. and Joppa and just moving right along. Wherever God tells him to go. Now we come to verse uh, 19 and it says, When Herod had searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. Mm. And he went down from Judea to C uh, Caesarea and stayed there. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aid and their friend, uh, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with uh, food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in purple uh, royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Mm. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. Wow. Now what a tragic, I, I don't know if this means, uh, if that was a, a d d progressive disease or what, but here's the thing that really grabs me. An angel of the Lord struck him. Well, it was just earlier in the chapter that an angel of the Lord struck, struck Peter. Peter. But when he struck Peter, Peter was awakened and delivered. When Herod is struck by the angel, he dies. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it goes to show us that an angel of the Lord, the angels of God, carry out God's uh, will. And God's will is ultimately that all men would be saved. Right. But men respond to God in different ways. And Herod has his day of opportunity. But Herod had turned his heart against God. And uh, he finally met with judgment. That's right. That's right. Well, you keep reading... There's one more verse, uh, a couple more verses here, but one more specifically that, that we'd like to look at today, and that's verse 24. It says, but the word of God grew and multiplied. You know, we've heard that before, haven't that's we? That's right. It seems to be a keynote here in Acts. It's incredible, as you read the book of Acts, that you have so much activity. It is hard to keep up with the book of Acts. That's right. And, and no matter, it, the thing is, it's in light of, they keep trying to squelch this faith, to put it out. And, and, and they're multiplying. Yeah, they can't mm. stop them. You know, so often, you know, in, in the beginning, it talked about how the, there were 3,000 added in a day, then, then it, the number grew to 5,000, and continually, and the Lord multiplied them, and the, the, the word was multiplied, et cetera. And, you know, sometimes I look at what happens in our own experiences, and I think, you know what? We're too satisfied with small successes when God wants to do so much more. Oh, how true. We need to attempt bigger things for God. That's right. How about you, uh, viewer? We're so thankful that you've joined us today, but we ask that you would consider attempting bigger things for God. We'll see you next time.